Um, so this talk is called You Might Not Need Pandas. Can I just get a show of hands? How many people are familiar with pandas, um, have used it, know what it is? Okay, so most people. Okay, so that's good. And how many people here um, have experienced programming in Python? Okay, good. So there's going to be some code in here. Um, so hopefully you'll understand all of it. Okay, first off, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as the moderator mentioned, I'm currently the managing director of, of Nerevu Development. Nerevu is a data analysis and software development firm. For the past eight years or so, I've been living in Tanzania. So I'm originally from um, America, um, in Chicago. Um, I've been living in Arusha, Tanzania since about 2010. Uh, and around three years ago, I started what's called Arusha Coders. And Arusha Coders is a community for developers, programmers, um, generally for techies who live in Arusha. Um, and we get together once a month and just discuss anything involving technology. Um, we have designers, programmers, um, coders, just anyone who is interested in technology and software, um, hardware, anything techy. Also, I'm the author of several popular Python um, packages. So one of them we'll be talking about a little later in this talk. It's called Meza. Uh, and there's a couple others as well. If you want to look them up, uh, so you might find a lot of those interesting. And then finally, um, I'm on most social media. Um, Rubano, you can find me pretty much anywhere. So this is um, Twitter and GitHub. Uh, but if there's any other social media, if you just search Rubano, um, if I'm on there, then you'll probably find me under that handle. Okay, so first, um, why pandas? So it's great that a lot of you already have experience with pandas. Um, I've used it a bit, uh, and there's definitely some great reasons why you should use it. Um, so first off, it's very fast. The people who program pandas, um, put a lot of thought into optimizing a lot of the functions and methods. Um, so a lot of the routines are written in either C or Fortran. Um, so they're very fast. Um, people complain about Python being slow, but a lot of the things that you can do with Python, um, sorry, with pandas, um, you get the speed that you wouldn't get using any other, um, any other Python libraries. Also, it's, um, it's very well known. So if you run into a problem, if you have a question about anything regarding pandas, um, there's talks, there's blog posts, um, there's Stack Overflow. Um, lots of resources are available about pandas. Um, so it's very easy to kind of get up and running uh, and to get help for any problem that you might run across. <clears throat> and lastly, it gets the job done. So pandas has lots and lots of functionality. Um, pretty much anything that you'd want to do regarding data analysis, um, pandas can do it for you. So if you can't do it with pandas, um, then you're going to be you're going to have a hard time finding something else that's going to be able to do it. <clears throat> and so because of that, there's several um, places or times when you definitely want to use pandas. Um, so first is going to be if speed is very important for you. If you're doing a lot of heavy data analysis uh, and you need something that kind of runs really fast and you, you, every second is going to count, um, then that's going to be a good reason for when you should use pandas. Another reason is if you already have code available. Code available. So maybe you're doing something similar to a type of analysis that you did before, or maybe a colleague of yours was um, running some kind of analysis and you can borrow some of the code that, that they already wrote. Um, it's going to be very easy for you to just modify the, the few things that have changed um, and just take advantage of a lot of the code that was already written. And finally, if you kind of are, you know, space for, if you kind of crunch for time, uh, maybe you have a deadline to meet uh, and you need to get this functionality out of the door, um, it might be something simple where you maybe don't need pandas, but it's already there. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, if that's the case, then go ahead and use what you have, and maybe on another day when you have more time, you can try to refactor and figure out how you can do it um, just using a different method. Okay, so now for the not so good stuff. Um, so why would you not use pandas? <clears throat> um, first, it's very complex. So 
due to the fact that they have a lot of optimizations and it's not written in pure Python, they have a lot of C and Fortran code, just installing Pandas um, gets very complicated. So if you ever have been to the Pandas website um, and read their installation instructions, um, it's very different from what you would see with other Python libraries. So most libraries, they, they have their package in what's called the Python package index, and you install it with a program called pip. If you go to Pandas, that is kind of the third or fourth option that they give you. The first option that they give you is to install Anaconda, and then after that, they suggest installing min Miniconda. And they do that because in order to install Pandas the normal way, um, you need a lot of prerequisites on your computer. You need special compilers, special programs to kind of run all the optimizations. And because of that extra complexity, um, they ask you to install something that kind of already has Pandas bundled into it. And that leads to the next point, which is very large. Um, so if you do their recommended uh, method of installing Anaconda, you're going to use up hundreds of megabytes um, just to get Pandas running on your computer. Um, if you don't do that and just use pip, um, because of all the dependencies, you're going to have tens of megabytes um, just downloading all the dependencies that Pandas needs to run. And then finally, it, um, it likes to use a lot of memory. So the way Pandas works and the way a lot of the tutorials and, and talks are um, recommend is kind of reading all of the data into memory um, when you initially load it. So if you have a very large data set, um, there can be times when you run, run out of memory just trying to load it into Pandas. And so because of this, there's going to be times when you don't want to use Pandas. And so I'll just go over a few of those. So first is if you don't really want to use all those extra dependencies. Maybe you're sharing your script with a colleague who um, doesn't know about pandas, and you don't want to kind of um, over overwhelm them with all these extra things. Second is if you like functional programming. Um, so the way that pandas kind of likes to do things is it's very object oriented. Um, they have what's called a data frame, which is the main data structure um, when you read things in. And the data frame has methods. And every time you use a method, you're constantly changing the information within that data frame. Uh, and it's kind of opposite of what you would do in if, you, if you've ever done any functional programming. So with functional programming, you don't really mutate data. Um, you kind of take one type of data and you transform it to another type of data. And then you do that by applying different functions. So with pandas, you're using methods on the objects. And with functional programming, you're using functions and you're just converting data from one type to another type. And lastly is if you have tight RAM constraints. So say your computer doesn't have a whole lot of RAM um, and you want to read in larger data sets, there's different things you can do. So one of them um, is chunking. So you can read in small pieces of the data at a time. Um, another option you can do is streaming. So when you stream data, um, you don't read in everything into memory. You only use the data that you need at that specific time. Um, so if you want to do anything like that, Pandas kind of makes it a little more difficult um, to do analysis that way. Okay, so. Hopefully, I've convinced you that you don't always need Pandas. So what are some alternatives that you can use? First is you can just use pure Python. Um, the, the standard library has lots and lots of modules and functions that are already available. Um, and for a lot of the simple analysis, you can just use um, whatever is already in, in Python standard library to do it for you. Um, you can also look at some of the source code in Pandas if you, you know, maybe you want some hints as to how they went about doing things. Um, another option is you can use um, a different library. So Meza is a library that I wrote, and I'm going to show you examples um, with this later on. Um, so Meza is a data processing library that is written using pure Python, and it um, attempts to cover a very small subset of the features that Pandas um, offers you. So if you kind of are interested in doing data analysis and you want something that's kind of leaner, more lightweight, um, you can look into Meza. 
There's, there's also other libraries as well. So I mentioned a few of these here. So CSV Kit, Messy Tables. Um, there's lots and lots of others. Um, lots of people have kind of come to the same realizations that you don't need something as complex as pandas all the time. So you can probably find a library that does specifically what you're looking for, um, and you might be able to cut out a lot of those dependencies. OK, so now we're going to get into the meat of the talk. Um, how many people here have heard of, of or read Choose Your Own Adventure books? Just show of hands. OK, no one. OK, interesting. <laughs> so it must be an American thing. Um, essentially, the way it works is um, as you're reading the book, they ask you questions. So you might um, be on um, some hunt, and it'll say, um, do you want to go into the forest and find the treasure, or do you want to you know, stay where you are and build a fire? And it'll say, turn to page 22 or turn to page 14. And so as you're reading it, um, you're faced with these different decisions, and um, depending on how you answer, then you'll have a different ending. Um, and mm -hmm. through all the combinations, you can have maybe 20, 30, 40 different um, endings to the story. So this talk is going to be kind of modeled after that. So probably um, it's gonna, it might, might be the first talk that you've had like this. Uh, and so instead of choose your own adventure, um, it's going to be choose your own analysis. OK. So first, um, just a quick disclaimer. Um, so I'm, I'm a lot of things, uh, so one of which is a, a data scientist, another is a software developer, but a few of the things that I'm not. So I'm not a pandas expert. Um, I've used pandas before, but um, I don't use it extensively. Um, so most of the examples in here I've um, figured out from either reading their website or the, the API um, or you know, Stack Overflow. So if you see some things that probably aren't the way you would do it in pandas, um, feel free to um, talk to me afterwards and just let me know. I'm also not a statistician. Um, so there's going to be some very basic um, statistics in here. Um, and from what I've read, I think it's you know, all pretty correct. But again, if there's anything that, if there's any statisticians in the audience and you notice something that isn't um, quite the way that you would normally do it, um, you know, please feel free to let me know. Also, I'm, I'm not a lipid operatorist, uh, so that's a, a butterfly scientist. Um, so this talk is, is going to be revolving around the monarch butterflies. Um, I'm going to be using some data that I got found from the, um, a few of the organizations here in Mexico and then also in the US. Uh, and so if there's anything I say that's incorrect, um, I'm just warning you now. Uh, so just, just don't blame me. <clears throat> OK. How many people are familiar with um, the monarchs, um, butterflies, and their hibernating schedule in, in Mexico? Just a show of hands. OK, maybe about half. Um, so this is something that I just recently learned about. Um, but every year, um, thousands, maybe millions, I'm not sure the exact number, of butterflies migrate from the US um, to Mexico. And the uh, World Wildlife Fund has been tracking the migrations every year. And it's kind of interesting the way they do it. So they don't actually count the number of butterflies. They count the area of forest that the butterflies kind of occupy. Um, because they kind of pack so densely onto the trees that you can't count them individually. And so what this graph shows you is the f forest area within Mexico um, that is covered by butterflies over time. Um, and so as you can see, um, kind of in these um, later years, the numbers have been kind of dwindling. And these are just a few pictures I found online of what it actually looks like inside the reserve. So I, I haven't been there myself, but I would, this is my first time in Mexico, and I definitely would like to come back um, and, and see this for myself. Um, but as you can see, the butterflies are pretty densely packed uh, on the trees. And so now what we're going to do, so um, thankfully I kind of got the data that you saw on that graph and you know, organized it in a neat tabular format. Um, so in order to kind of investigate what's going on, um, we first want to read this data um, in using Python. And so we're going to have a couple of different ways to do it. So the first is going to be reading a, an Excel file, and then the other option will be reading an HTML file. 
Um, and so in both cases, it's the same data. This is just showing you the first few rows of, of data, um, but this is gonna be available in either Excel or, or HTML. So this is the first decision as an audience that you have. How many people would want to parse the Excel file with Python? Just a raise of hands. Okay, and how many people want to scrape the HTML file? Okay, I think the Excel file um, won. So can you click on Excel file? Okay, great. So first, we're going to do this um, just using pandas. So pandas has a pretty cool function um, called Excel file. And so the first thing we do is we get this book object and we just pass in the name of the Excel file, and here it's just data.xlsx, um, and so we get the book object. Once we have the book object, then we can pass in the name of the sheet um, that we want to parse. And in this case, there's just a sheet called hibernation, and it has the data for um, all the various years. And once that's available, with pandas, there's a method um, that's called head, and it just kind of gives you a preview of the data that's there. So here you can see the first five rows of data. Um, we have the years, and then um, the data, which is the forest area that's covered by the butterflies and acres. Um, so pretty straightforward. So next, we're going to see how we would do that same thing um, if we didn't use pandas. So there's a pretty um, nice library called XLRD. Um, you can just pip install XLRD, and it gives you a function open workbook. And so this is kind of similar to the way Pandas works. You pass in the name of the Excel sheet that you want, and then you get the book object. And then once you have that, you can give it the name of the sheet um, that you want to extract the data from. And so here, we're just passing in hibernation, the same as before. And now what we can do is we can use the method um, row value. So we can look at any row that we want. And here I'll just, I'm just showing you the first two rows. So the, the first row is obviously the header row. So you can see the year um, and the forest area. And then the next row is the very first row of data. Um, so you could continue doing that to um, see more and more of the rows if you wanted to. Um, so again, very, very straightforward. And then finally, I'll show you how you would do the same thing using the Mesa library that I told you about. So with Mesa, there's um, a module called IO, which just stands for input output. And there's a function called read XLS. Uh, and this works a little differently. So this reads in the Excel file and the sheet at the same time. Um, so by default, it'll just give you the first sheet that's there. Um, and so there isn't anything special that needs to be done. Um, there's also um, a nice option um, which is called Sanitize that I made available. And what Sanitize does is it normalizes the column. Is the mic still on? Okay, so it normalizes the column headings. Um, a lot of times when you get files, um, the capitalization might be off or they have spaces or um, odd characters. So Sanitize just makes everything lowercase and replaces the spaces in different characters um, with underscores. And so we're just passing in that option. And so another difference that um, Mesa has is it doesn't read in the whole file at once. Um, it kind of works using um, in, what in Python is, are called iterators. And so in this case, hibernation is an iterator of the data. Uh, there's a, a function that I made available called peak, which works very similarly to the pandas method head. And so it gives you a list of just the first five rows of data. And so that way you can read in a huge Excel file and only use up the amount of data um, for the first five rows. So here we're using the peak function and then you get back the original iterator, which is the hibernation, and then the head, which is going to be the first five rows of data. And then here in this case, we're just going to look at the first three rows. So you see another difference is that the list that you get is a list of dictionaries. And so within the dictionary, the keys are going to be the column names, and then the values are going to be the actual um, data values that are in the cell. So can you click on that next button? Great, okay, so now, congrats. Um, we've read in the data. 
uh, and you know, we can kind of see how much area um, the butterflies occupied within the forest. So this is just kind of an overview. So these are a chart of the first few years. Um, so going through the data, so kind of like I mentioned before, you're a little bit worried that the numbers have started to decline over the years. And you have a couple of suspicions um, as to why that might be. So one is that you suspect it could be related to deforestation um, within Mexico. Another thing you suspect is increased pesticide use um, within the U.S. And so here, this is um, some additional data that I got for both of those things. Uh, so the deforestation is uh, measured in hectares, and it's the, um, essentially the area of, of forest that had been deforested within those years. And then after that is the pesticide usage, overall pesticide usage within the U.S. Um, in millions of pounds. Um, and you can see that's been st steadily increasing year over year. So here is your next decision. You can either look more to investigate the deforestation um, or pesticide usage. So just a raise of hands, how many people want to investigate deforestation? OK. And pesticides? OK, I think deforestation got that. Can you click? OK. So again, the World Wildlife Fund, um, they had a pretty interesting study um, where they kind of measured the deforestation over time. And you can see in this picture, it's measured by the red and orange areas on the map. And so again, I was able to get um, some nice tabular format of the data. And in this case, it's just gonna, we're gonna assume um, you wanted to do an Excel. So kind of similar to before, we're using the pandas um, Excel function to read in that Excel file. And now we want to see how the impact of deforestation um, relates to the hibernation. So we're going to read in two sheets this time, um, the deforestation sheet and the hibernation sheet. And here, the difference is that uh, the data is measured over different years. So in pandas, there's a function or a method called merge. And so we pass it in two of those data frames, and it's going to take all of the rows of data where they have information for the same year and create one data frame. And that way, it'll be a lot easier to analyze this information because it's going to remove all the extra data that is only available in one or the other data set. And then if we take a look at it, um, this is just what it looks like. So we have the years, and then um, the first column is the area of deforested. Um, forest, and then the second column is the forest area that's covered by um, the, the butterfly colonies. So now what we want to do is we want to look at a correlation. How many people here are familiar with correlation? Okay, almost everybody. So essentially what we want to do is we want to see if the area that is deforested year over year, does that have uh, an impact on how many butterfly colonies um, are present within each year. And so in this case, we just want two columns of data. So X is going to be the deforested area. And then Y is going to be the forest area covered by butterfly colonies. And with pandas, they make it pretty nice. So if you have a column of data, there's a, a method just called um, core, which stands for correlation. So you can um, do a quick calculation and see the correlation is there. And it's not a great correlation. Uh, and it, you know it's, it's under one, but this still suggests there might be something there. Now we want to do the same thing without using pandas. Um, so we're going to open the workbook like before with XLRD. Uh, and just like in pandas, we're going to read in those two sheets, so the deforestation sheet and the hibernation sheet. Uh, now here, where it gets a little different, um, since we don't have the convenient function of merge that we had in pandas, we have to manually figure out what years are in common for both of the data sets. So here, what we're doing is we're just using this method, um, Kyle values. So we're saying we want to extract the first row of column, sorry, the first column of data, which is the year. And we want to start um, 
at the second row, which is, is, in, is zero index, because we, we don't want the header row. So we get all the years for deforestation, all the years for hibernation, and now we just want to see which years are in common. And so with Python, they make it pretty simple. So there's a data structure called sets, and we can just take the intersection of those two and find out which ones are in common. And then this is just what it looks like. So um, you know, the several years that we have in common. So now what we want to do is filter each of these data sets to only include data for the years that are mentioned right there. And so the first thing we want to do is get the rows of data for each of those sets. So the row, all the rows for deforestation, all the rows for hibernation. And then once we have that, um, we can do a list comprehension. And so here what we're doing, um, we're, we're looping through the rows and we call each one R. So we want to first do a filter to see that, so R0 is going to be the year. And we want to say if that year, the value of it is in common, which is that set that's up here, um, then keep it in the you know keep it in the list. Otherwise, get rid of it. And then the value that we're extracting, so you can see there is R2, um, which is just the third column of data. And then we do something similar um, for Y. So now we're just getting R1, which is going to be the second column of data. And this is going to be, the, I guess, the most complex slide. So since pandas does correlation for you automatically, we have to write our own function to do correlation. Um, I'm not going to really get into the details of this, um, but basically what I did is I just went on Google, um, did a search for correlation function, and just try to convert that into, um, into Python syntax. Um, one thing I will point out is this line here. So covar just stands for the covariance. Um, so if you can get the covariance, um, you can calculate the correlation um, using the covariance. Um, but if you want more details into that, um, I'm sure Google can help you or Wikipedia, um, but it's um, something that you could probably find in a stats book to really um, figure out how those things are related. Um, so once we have a function that can calculate the correlation, um, we just pass in those two lists of data, so that x and that y. And then once we do that, then we get the same value that we saw um, using pandas. And then finally, this is how you would do it using Meza. So similar to before, we're going to read in um, the, the Excel sheet. Uh, and in this case, the deforestation is going to be that second sheet. So here, we're just passing in that sheet equals 1. Um, and for hibernation, by default, it's just going to read in the first sheet. So now we have both sheets. Um, there's a, another function that's nice for Meza, which is called filter, um, or sorry, tfilter. So this is doing that same job of filtering the data for all the years that are in common. And the way you do it is you pass in a function here, which runs a check on each row of data. So this function is going to take the year, which is y there. Um, and in this case, um, everything, all the, the data that gets read in gets read in as a string. So we just convert it to a float, and then we just want to check to say, is it in common? If it's there, then it keeps the data. Otherwise, it just kind of spits it, back, it spits it away. And then once we do that, on this bottom row, we get back a new set of records, which is just all the filtered um, deforestation records. And then the same thing for hibernation. So we're just filtering the original hibernation um, d data, and we get out the one that just has all the years that are in common. And so now that we have the rows with just the data in common, we can extract the actual values themselves. And so one of the nice things here is that um, with Meza, you can actually pass in the column name. Um, so you don't have to remember, is it the first column or the second column or what? You can just directly give it the name. Um, and like I said, they're passed in the strings originally. So here, we're just converting everything to a float. Um, so in this case, 
D records is just uh, an, a list of dictionaries. So R is a dictionary, and in this case, we're just saying we want the deforested area column for X, and then for Y, we want the forested area. And just like before, we're using the correlation function um, that we already defined, and so here we can see um, we get the same correlation that we got before. Okay, so great. Now that's done, so we calculated the correlations, uh, and this is just a visual, so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, so you can see it's um, f you know, slightly positive. One of the things that I noticed is, is it actually going in the wrong direction. So this is saying the more deforestation you get, the more butterfly colonies that you get, which doesn't really make sense. Um, but in this case, I'm just kind of showing you how you would go about analyzing the data. So I'm sure someone who did a more rigorous approach could probably figure out um, you know, what you could do to make it look the way you think that it should look. Oh, sorry. Can you push next? Okay, so now we have the data um, and we need to give it to a colleague. So the colleague has said that they either want it in a CSV file or a JSON file. Um, so this is going to be your final decision. How many people want to save the data to a CSV file? Okay, and how many people want to save it to a JSON file? Okay, I think JSON won. Can you click that? Okay. So first, using pandas, um, we're just going to create the data. Uh, and for here, they, they like their, their data values to be in a list. Um, so you, that's why the list is there. Then we're using the data frame function. And you can see this is just what it looks like. So we just have the metric, which is correlation coefficient, and then the value. And then they have a nice function or a nice method to JSON. So you just say data frame to JSON, and then you give it the name. And that's pretty much it. Without using pandas, um, it's pretty similar. Well, it's not similar. It's pretty simple. Um, in this case, we can just give it a dictionary. And there's a nice function um, called dump that you just get from importing JSON. Uh, and here, we're going to open the file, the results.json, and then just pass it, uh, pass the row of data to the dump function. Uh, and that's pretty much all you have to do. For Meza, it's pretty simple as well. So we also have a dictionary. And here, we're using one of the conversion functions called records to JSON. So we pass it the individual record. Um, and in this case, we're putting it in a list because records um, should be a, a, a list. So we pass it the records, and then we get out the converted results. And then there's a function called write, and we pass it the file name, and then it just writes it to that file name. And then as a nice bonus, it kind of tells you how much data it wrote out as well. So that's where the 68 at the bottom comes in. So, and that's it. So now you're able to read, manipulate, um, and save data without having to use pandas. Okay, so thank you. Any questions? Hi there. Uh, more than a question, can we see how you parse the HTML? Oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, it's pretty nice the the way you did it, like mm -hmm. like the never-ending story book, for mm -hmm. instance. But sure. I, I really, really, yeah, really I wish can. To. Um, Thank can, you. Can you can you go back? So it might be easier if you go to the full view. Um, is that, let me, I could probably find it too. Here, we're going to scrape HTML. 
Okay, so for pandas, they have a function um, read HTML. So all we're gonna do is pass it the, file, the HTML file name, uh, and then we get the data frame by calling read HTML. So read HTML uh, returns a list of each table it finds in the HTML. So in this case, there's only one table. So we're just saying give it the first table, and then you get back a data frame. Also, I noticed that it likes to include the header row twice. So that second line basically is removing that redundant header row. And then once you look at the data, so you can see um, you know, that that's pretty much as we expected. If you want to do it without pandas, there's a nice library called Beautiful Soup. Um, so Beautiful Soup is just an HTML parsing library. Uh, and similarly, you pass uh, the name of the file that you want to open, um, and you get that file pointer. You pass it into Beautiful Soup. Um, then you get back a soup object. From there, when you call soup.table, that just returns the first table that it found in the HTML. Uh, and in this case, we want the tr tags inside the table. So that's the find all tr, and then we get a list of all the tr tags. This is just going to be a helper function that we're using. Um, how many people here are familiar with generator functions? Just a show of hands. OK, not a, not a lot. So generator functions are great when you have a lot of data and you don't want to read everything in at once. So the main difference is this line, which says yield. So yield basically means every time I request more data, just give it to me. And generator functions have yield, whereas regular functions have return. And so in this case, we're going to loop through each of the TR tags. And we know, so essentially TR is just, you can think of it as a row. And we know that it's either going to be a header row or a data row. And so this is just saying if it's a header, then get, get that. Otherwise, if there's no header, then it's probably going to be a data row. So find that. And then this last line is kind of what does the majority of the work. So element, you can think of it as a column. So for element in a row, basically saying for every column in the row, give me the text, which is just, in this case, going to be the data. And so once we do that, um, we can pass in the TRs to that function um, that we just created. And here, since it's an iterator, we have to use um, iSlice, which is from iter tools, and then convert it back into a list. And so here, we're just saying, show me the first three rows of data, and then you would get that. And then using Meza, there's a function called read HTML. And so this works just like the read XLS. Um, you pass it the file name. Um, here I'm saying, say, sanitize is true. Um, and just like before, using the peak function. And then here you can see the first three rows of data. So just like before, a list of dictionaries. So that's it. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question about, uh, well, creating tooling is amazing. Um, it's like uh, fun and, and like I always uh, like to do that. But when you uh, start having like uh, people using your, your, your tools, uh, it's like a lot of responsibility, right? Uh, how much time do you spend uh, like solving issues and, and that kind of like, like implementing new features? Right, right. So uh, the question is how much time do I spend kind of solving issues and looking at features? Um, I think for one library, it's not a huge amount. The problem comes when I have lots of libraries, because now you're getting issues from anything. And what I've noticed is in the past few months, there's kind of been an uptick. And I'm guessing it might have something to do with tax season, um, because I have a, a library that I use for um, converting um, CSV files into a format that you can upload into QuickBooks. And that library has gotten a lot more issues. So for me, it's only been the past few months where maybe every week there's something new. Up, in, up until then, maybe a, every couple of months, there may have been something. 
Uh, and then the features just come as I need them. So I like to use my own libraries, and it comes about because I want to do something that other libraries don't you know, allow me to do. And so I'm essentially making features that I need for myself to solve my own problem. Um, I don't really get a whole lot of feature requests from other people. And if I do, then I'll point them into how they can potentially implement it themselves, um, because I don't always have time to implement their, you know, their future requests. So. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much, Ruben. Thank you.